Welcome everyone to the familiar battleground of Hearts of Iron 4. Today we will be making a different video. I will be comparing this game and Hearts of Iron 2. The version of Hearts of Iron 2 I will be using in this video is Darkest Tower Hearts of Iron game. One thing to keep in mind is that in this game there is also a World War 1 scenario coming right off the bat. But I never found it too fun to actually play, so I will be not including it too much. Uh, today I want to just give you the uh, full details on some of the more basic functions that both games share, such as obviously government, trade, research, production, just so that you can have your own opinion on it. And then if uh, it's requested, and you can request that in the comments by liking the video, etc. I will also be going a little bit more in depth in towards how the game simulates the actual conflict of World War II, how the game in handles modding, and how the game also handles combat. I will not be going over it in this particular video because I'm kind of meaning to keep it a little short. Now, starting off the government. The laws and government in Hearts of Iron 4 are in a way a little bit simplified from Hearts of Iron 2, as you will see. There is the political power system. In Hearts of Iron 2, there is no political power. And what this means is that, in general, you will have a progression between the game that will uh, start with you having nothing, and then at the end you having an entire government filled out and you having no more need for political power. Whereas in Darkest Tower, you have your cabinet filled up from the start, who ver have various, obviously, bonuses and malices who will improve or decrease your chances of winning. Sometimes these things are not exactly clear-cut. Um, for example, there are certain ministers which do give you malices to certain things. Not sure if I can find one right away, but yeah. Also, uh, another difference is that in Hearts of Iron 4, what you do with uh, technology teams is that you essentially select them with your political power, just like your normal uh, advisors. Whereas in Hearts of Iron 2 and in Darkest Tower, you have various different tech teams that are assigned to a country from the start. These you cannot change. You can only receive some through the various different events that can happen throughout the game. Uh, that is depending on, of course, the uh, mod also that you're playing sometimes. And these Various different tech teams have different skills that can be applied to techs. We'll be talking more about that in the tech tree. In Hearts of Iron 4, the laws are managed by three um, parameters. Your economy law, your trade law, and your conscription law. And here, you have a various different sliders that determine both your political allegiance in terms of ideology. You don't only have the three ones that... Uh, Hearts of Iron 4 ships with. You have a much more complicated system with two sliders, democratic, authoritarian, political left, and political right to determine your uh, allegiance in the end. And then you have a lot of different sliders which determine exactly how your country is supposed to be run, which are the essentially counterparts to the national laws, except they do go a little bit more in depth. These can be changed once every year normally, Per game, the USA has a debuff where you cannot uh, do it quite as quickly, but in general, it is a one per year change, so it is very slow to change these sliders. There are 10 different levels for each slider, going from obviously fully on one end to fully on the other end, and so that's uh, gonna take quite a while for you to actually change your country. It's not quite as easy as actually getting the political power. In my opinion, the most important aspect in this category is the difference between Hearts of Iron 4 and 2 and the manpower and mobilization law. In Hearts of Iron 4, that mobilization law will just constantly get higher and will give you several just refills of manpower. Whereas one of the laws is actually mobilization and demobilization. This is what ends up actually affecting your manpower growth. So as you can see right now, I'm getting 0.004 the manpower a day, basically nothing. But you have a decision, enact partial mobilization or enact full mobilization or even further if you mobilize further, 
which is going to give you a nice boost of manpower right off the bat. Decisions are a um, essentially a way to fire events when you want them to fire. Moving on to diplomacy, or no, eh, let's just have research first. Research in Hearts of Iron 4 is quite interesting, however it is quite simplified from Hearts of Iron 2, as you will see. Now, there are several different types of guns that you can research, four types by default, unless you have some kind of mod, four different types of half-track, which turn into motorized infantry, three different types of special forces, the obvious marines, mountain infantry, and paratroopers. Then you have the support company system, which you will see. Armor being a pretty simple tree of just a couple of light vehicles, a couple of medium vehicles coming down onto the modern tank along with the heavy vehicles. Artillery being just a very simple just scroll down tree of having anti-air, artillery, and anti-tank. Then land doctrines, naval, very very straightforward as well with naval. Uh, two types of cruiser classes, heavy cruisers and light cruisers, one destroyer class, one battle, battle cruiser, one battleship, one aircraft carrier, one submarine, and a landing craft. Naval doctrines, aircraft, one tree for fighters, one tree for close air supports, one tree for naval bombers, one tree for heavy fighters, one tree for tactical bombers, one tree for strategic bombers. Air doctrines, and then everyone's favorite, engineering and industry. Engineering, having the electronic mechanical engineering and general electronical machines and computer techs giving you a research time decrease. And then the radio techs jumping down to the radar, also having the atomic research and experimental rockets as a side. And then the industry tree having the machine tools techs and then having the concentrated or dispersed industry techs. And then construction, increasing your construction speed, excavation, increasing your resource gain efficiency, and the synthetic refineries. In Hearts of Iron 2, the tech tree is in some ways more expensive, but also in some ways more rigid. There are various different types of infantry, mountain infantry, naval, etc., for every kind of unit that you can deploy various different types of techs that you research to update them. Then what you do is you go in the production screen and you actually upgrade it manually um, through this upgrade slider that we'll be talking more about later. And so you don't exactly have the ability to mix and match various levels of equipment. You have the infantry tab, which includes your special forces like marines, mountain infantry, your motorized infantry, your mechanized infantry, your engineers, which are a um, brigade that essentially replace support companies in this game. And then you have the logistics techs, which increase something called the TC modifier, transport capacity, which is up here, which is tied to exactly how much you can transport around, basically uh, is given by your infrastructure. And it affects your ability to use heavier units like mechanized infantry, armor, etc and also in general to supply your troops. Armor and artillery, which is a fusion of both armor and artillery trees, normal. You also have armored car brigades, which in Hearts of Iron 4 are not present. Then you have aircraft, pretty much the same. Industrial, where you have pretty much the techs you'd, you'd be expecting, the production techs and the construction techs. Usually, uh, give you production bonuses and construction bonuses. They don't work with the um, building slots. We'll be talking more about those later because there are no building slots in Hearts of Iron 2. And then you have the computing machine techs, which increase your research, research modifier. Agriculture is also something that is present, which increases your industrial efficiency and your industrial efficiency supplies, which is a modifier that essentially uh, governs how quickly you can build supplies. The more you have of this modifier, the more production you have towards supplies. We'll be talking more about that later. Then you have synthetic oil, pretty standard. Um, although you don't build refineries in this game, you don't build physical refineries, you have an industrial multiplier energy to oil. We'll be talking more about that later. 
you have different types of equipment that you can research for various different climates. And then once you research the tropical, uh, or not the tropical, the, the vehicle version, you also get a decision out here uh, to produce mm, essentially a high amount of that type of equipment, which will increase the cost of all of your units, but also give you bonuses towards um, obviously fighting in various different climates. You have your radar. You have your medicine techs, which increase your trickle, ba trickle back modifier, which uh, gives you back manpower towards your units instead of essentially deleting it because the guys have died. Naval doctrines, air doctrines, and land doctrines. Land doctrines are a little bit different because they have a uh, date system that limits how uh, quickly you can research them, whereas in Hearts of Iron 4, doctrines can be researched basically whenever you want. You can fill up the whole tree by 1939 if you have the right tech um, prowess as your country. Whereas in Hearts of Iron 4, it is generally uh, just like all the other uh, levels of tech restricted by your time. You also have obviously the hospital techs as well. And then you have something called armor division, division formation. Without this, you cannot recruit uh, armor divisions. Pretty standard stuff. You can only recruit armored brigades. Then you have a very interesting thing called the secret weapons tri tech tree, which works in this following way. Essentially, you have various different techs like experimental rocket engine over here in industrial, which unlock for you the ability to essentially have a chance every day that the game runs to unlock the research of these secret weapons. If you don't unlock it, you cannot research it. As you can see right now, it's red. That means I can't research it. So I can't research rocket test and research facility if I don't get the so-called breakthrough. And then you get the access from these um, texts to various different advanced units, such as nuclear carriers, nuclear battleships, nuclear submarines, nuclear bombs, obviously surface-to-air missiles, which increase your black power, which is how effective your anti-air buildings are, uh, air cavalry from attack helicopters, air-to-surface missiles, which increase your naval attack for all of your ground attack aircraft, and all various different kinds of things, turbojet engines, obviously, you basically whatever you can expect. Speaking of diplomacy, there isn't really that much to be talking about. The Different levels of how much countries like each other are represented by a scale from minus 100 to 100, or plus 100, I guess. And you can do various actions to improve that. Um, I think the pretty much the highlight of the Hearts of Iron 4 diplomacy are to boost party popularity, stage queue, and create faction. Factions are dynamic. The diplomacy is very similar in Hearts of Iron 2. Um, except you have a 200 to minus 200 spread of relations that can happen, so I guess it's a little bit more, uh, in a way, deep in that end, although it's really not that important. You can also use a, um, you can also use a part of the diplomacy system called intelligence over here to essentially fuck with other countries. Um, sorry for that, but yeah, it's essentially what you do. You have a espionage level overall. For example, we have 11, which is costing us daily money. Now, money is something that we will talk about in the resources section. And then what that does is it increases uh, the amount of espionage effectiveness that we have or efficiency in other countries. For example, in Canada, we have 41%. That is partially because our uh, intelligence level is very high. 11 is about halfway to 20, which is the max level which in 1936 is extremely good. Most countries start with a very low uh, level of intelligence. And then what this translates, or also distance applies as well, and your relations with a country. So for example, with Canada, we have pretty good relations, so we have more efficiency. What that ends up transferring to is that you can spy what people have in terms of armies, navies, resources, which in Hearts of Iron 4 is handled by the um, description text solely and then you can do various types of espionage missions such as industrial espionage which steals a blueprint which is a research bonus a smear campaign which increased the descent in the target country and the descent uh, essentially is how much people are 
disagreeing with the rule of a particular country, which directly translates to revolt risk. And then you have the sabotage industry, which sometimes destroys a... Uh, I believe... the Actually, no, it delays a production project. Support partisans, which spawns rebels in their areas. Global manipulation, etc., etc. Resources and trade are where the two games differ probably the most. In Hearts of Iron 4, your resources are divided into six categories. Oil, aluminum, rubber, tungsten, steel, and chromium. And they are directly a currency, kind of, that you use to uh, purchase your units in the production screen. However, what they're used for is for the production efficiency of those factories that are actually producing your equipment. So if you don't have any of a resource, you can still produce something, just at a slow rate. And also, oil and um, other types of resources that could be used to maintain, figuratively, your factories and your armored vehicles in operations don't really have a stockpile that can be drained so you can move your motorized troops across the entire globe without ever, ever having to essentially have a drop of oil in their tanks this is a big difference yes and hearts of iron 2 resources are basically much different because you have a stockpile for them. They are not just constant modifiers, I guess, that you have. They are physical things that ends up, end up in your depots and end up being used. Now, if I let the game run for one day right now, um, it will calculate, I believe, also the depots. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have. Yes, now, the stockpile levels. Uh, stockpile levels are essentially how much of a type of material you can stockpile before you start running into inefficiencies such as wastages, etc, etc. Which means that when you reach over that level of stockpile, for example for metal, um, we have a 47,000 around max stockpile as the United States. Once our metal count over here goes over 47,000, we will start losing metal at a very, very high rate. And essentially it will go back over to the uh, stockpile level. So what this means is that you cannot do like in Hearts of Iron 3 where you just go and stockpile 999 of every resource before the war starts. You can't do that in Hearts of Iron 2. Um, you have four basic types of resources, energy, metal, rare materials, and oil, which are used to help power your industry. And they're also used to help produce various different types of units and vehicles. Then you have supplies, which are essentially ammunition and food rations, which keep your troops running, money, which keeps your government running and your research running, so it's used mainly for intelligence and the um, payment of tech teams, actually, because if I, for example, assign a tech team to a project, as you can see, they require some um, payment each day to continue with that at full speed. If I cannot pay the cost and essentially go red with money, they will research at a reduced rate. Then you obviously have the scent, which as I've already explained a little bit, transport capacity, etc, etc. This is also reflected in trade. In Hearts of Iron 4, trade is used with um, the civilian factory system, which we will talk more about later. And it's also tied to the trade laws. Trade laws influence how much of a determined type of resource a country can export uh, or has to export to the foreign market. The trade is also different. Um, obviously, you do deals with various different countries for the diplomacy. For example, um, like this, you can negotiate trade agreements for ex essentially getting income from the uh, and in, from another country of a type of resource. And what you do is you exchange it for usually money is what you do. Which brings us over to construction. Construction works. The construction and economy in general works a lot differently in Hearts of Iron 4. You have two types of industrial capacity, military and civilian. Military directly goes on to producing actual equipment for your armies, whereas civilian is used to construct various buildings around your nation, such as infrastructure, air bases, anti-air, and radars. These are also present in Hearts of Iron 2. 
with the difference that there's also naval dockyards. So there is a different type of industrial capacity for producing vehicles, guns, etc. for your land forces and your air forces, and your ships. Your ships use a different type of building to construct. Rocket sites are also a production facility. Uh, they automatically produce rockets when they are built, and they automatically store rockets, and they function then as an airbase. In Hearts of Iron 2, production is handled differently. You have a, one unified industrial capacity. You have no civilian and military, and you also have no naval dockyards. And that industrial capacity can be redistributed onto five different, I guess, uses. You have consumer goods, which produce money and also reduce your descent. Um, and you also have a consumer goods need. If you have less factories than the need for consumer goods, you essentially lose, you gain rather descent every, um, every day that you have that running. And you also probably lose money, which was, is what I wanted to say. Production, which is used to produce what you have in your production queue. More on that later. Supplies, produces supplies. Reinforcements reinforces your units. For example, if we go over here, we can see that some of these divisions are not at full strength. For example, this one is at 10% strength. So obviously, you need to have some way to replenish your troops. And then upgrades upgrades their uh, the infantry. For example, if we had 1936 infantry available, then all these divisions would be upgrading to 1936 infantry. Naval bases are used to base your, obviously, navies, but also to bring supplies on over to different continents, such as if we go to our supply map mode, we can see that our islands in the Pacific are supplied, and most of that supply is coming in because of the naval base, and that also limits the amount of supplies that are able to come in to the level of the naval base. A higher level naval base obviously will have a much heavier um, capacity. Then you also have land forts and coastal forts, just as in Hearts of Iron 4. You also have the ability to convert the two various types of civilian and military factory uh, from each other to another, which also is a pretty useful thing to have. Moving on over to the production, this is where differences also seem to pick up very heavily. In Hearts of Iron 4, the production is handled so that you build various types of equipment and then you use those types of equipment to train up divisions. For example, if I decide to train an infantry division, I can see that I need 910 infantry equipment, 24 pieces of artillery, and 30 pieces of support equipment. In Hearts of Iron 2, recruitment is handled much differently. You don't have various different types of equipment that you produce and then you uh, essentially assemble the puzzle into divisions depending on how you design a division. Your, your division is just templates that you just have them. You don't modify them. You can only modify them by adding brigades, which are kind of like support companies. So you have really no option of building a basic division. What this represents is a division that's kind of already uh, got the full package of at least the infantry battalions, the recon company, etc., etc., and also the logistics company, etc., etc., etc. So as you can see. In the count that it gives you of the various different, essentially, types of equipment that are going into the division, that's mostly just for flavor, they don't actually do anything in game. There's already men, artillery, heavy artillery, horses, and motor vehicles. That production cost is calculated even for a very small miner that would, in Hearts of Iron 4, just not build uh, the artillery company and then just deploy the division reviving artillery. What this means is that big countries uh, in general in Hearts of Iron 4, uh, Hearts of Iron 2 are a little bit more powerful than the smaller ones because they are able to build together forces much more easily because of their higher IC. Because of the ability to assign more than one factory to one production and then essentially work out how important it is to you and prioritize it that way, it is much, much easier to concentrate your production on something. This also includes something that is kind of important, which is ships. 15 dockyards producing one type of ship will be much faster than anything Hearts of Iron 2 um, in Hearts of Iron 2 can, that can be built as a ship. Now, what this means is that 
some countries, such as the United States, will have a very, very strong navies. There is also a difference in that in Hearts of Iron 2, submarines and destroyers are representing just one ship. And now moving on to the last one of these big changes is the National Focus System, obviously. The National Focus System is a way for Paradox to have a more organic play experience that will be looking like the player is doing things, but in fact is just kind of railroading the player onto one of several different paths. In Hearts of Iron 2, this is handled with events that happen or are uh, triggered by the player through decisions when certain con conditions are actually met. So for example, for the anti common turn pact, the year needs to be at least 1937. What this means is that, especially on a historical mode, or uh, sandbox mode as some people call it, certain countries selected by the AI, and then of course the player, depending on what the player wants to do, will have behaviors severely different from those of the country in history, and they will be, in general, doing things in a much different order. For example, in Hearts of Iron 4, it is very possible that Germany waits to remilitarize the Rhineland until 1947. So I think that about concludes it. I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, give me some ideas in the comments of what I could have talked about differently, uh, what you just want to know about Hearts of Iron 2 in case you've not played it. And then also tell me if you want to see more of this kind of video in the future with more information rather than actual gameplay. So yeah, I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.